This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Michael Miller, welcome to the Self Publishing Show. Great to have you with us. You've um, you've gone great guns in just a few brief years. So we're excited to hear all about your your story. But why don't you start off by telling us a bit about yourself? Oh, uh, thanks, James. It's great to be here. Uh, Long time listener, first time calling, I suppose you might say. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm Michael R. Miller. Uh, I'm an epic fantasy author. Uh, I'm best known for the Dragon's Blade trilogy and the ongoing series Songs of Chaos, which is a kind of big Dragon Rider epic, um, harkening back to some of the classics of the genre. Mm, how did you get going in publishing then? Because I think you started out briefly, at least, in trad. No, I've never been trad published. I did work... Um, for Bloomsbury briefly in 2017. So I'd, I'd already been, I'd been self-publishing for at least a year and a half by that point. I got a job at Bloomsbury in London, uh, worked there for about a year, and then I left um, to start uh, Portal Books, which was a digital press that focused on RPG and progression fantasy. And by that time, my own books were just at the cusp of being viable for full time. So I kind of took the leap a little bit early to do two things, because doing all three would have been, you know, just way too much <laughs> would have collapsed. Did you say you started Portal Books? Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Portal Books had three founders, me, uh, Taryn Mafra, who is a, a best-selling YA fantasy author, and our friend Brooke Aston, who was a marketer at um, Heinz um, at quite a high level. So we all had kind of unique insights and skills, and, and we just got along like a house on fire. I actually met them from an event that Bloomsbury ran, um, it was like a kind of fantasy uh, day at the Bloomsbury offices in London where they had uh, speakers, agents and stuff like that. And it was just a kind of, just an event, but we were all there and we got to talking and then we found that we had a lot in common and we really were really fascinated by like, RPG and what it was doing and we were all reading it and enjoying it. And so, yeah, we just kind of um, foolishly thought, yeah, let's try this, let's give it a go. And how? <laughs> that was back in, so we set that up in early 2018 um, as of last year, I'm no longer involved in the day-to-day. -day. I kind of stepped down as a director. Brooke is now running the show. But yeah, in those, in those first years, it was, you know, full on. Uh, lots of fun in the early days, actually. Yeah. So that's still going? That's still going, going stronger than ever. I just got to a stage where I was splitting my time, you know, uh, a little bit too much into Portal when my own books were doing so well. And I think when I had a bit of reflection, I always wanted to be an author first rather than running a full business and having all the extra responsibilities and burdens of worrying about other people's you know livelihoods and stuff like that it's enough to worry about your own yeah. at times mm -hmm. um, but they're going and doing better than ever so it's really cool to see them just taking off yeah as somebody who runs a small imprint I know that very well indeed <clears throat> I'd love just to concentrate on my books um anyway yeah so so you got going, uh, you'd already started self-publishing before you had that yes. brief. I mean, I'm interested in the Bloomsbury bit because I think you were working on digital within Bloomsbury, which is, for me, a fascinating little glimpse into what their mindset is about digital. Yeah, so, I mean, bearing in mind, this was back in 2017, so it may well have drastically changed, right? And uh, I was mainly working um, in the kind of data side of it, so working in cleaning up some of their data internally. Um, they were moving everything into Salesforce. So there was a lot of Excel spreadsheet work. I wasn't directly involved with making any marketing, okay. you know, graphics or decisions, but I was part of the digital marketing department. So I did see kind of what was going on there. What struck me was there wasn't at that point, there doesn't seem like a huge amount. I mean, it was kind of the case that there was one person who would put up the social media posts. If they ran some Facebook ads, it was really broad, and it was just about trying to get impressions, but in the very in the most loose sense possible. It didn't seem very targeted. It sort of seemed like every post got the same audience, kind of just blasted out generically. It wasn't targeted towards the genre type or the age range, um, and they were selling books directly from their own website, but they had quite strict DRM on the books, and they they originally downloaded this very strange. Adobe files, which were just difficult and clumsy to work. Um, one thing that did happen whilst I was there was um, all the new hires got brought into a meeting with the CEO. And um, I, I don't know what the purpose of it was, maybe just to sort of 
so you get to meet him or something. There was maybe like 10 of us around the table. And he kind of went around asking people who'd only been there for maybe two weeks, what should we be doing differently? And I don't know what he expected to hear, but I said, you should probably take DRM off those emails yeah. <laughs> because it's making things really difficult for people. Because I, I, sitting in the department, a couple of um, support staff were just constantly dealing with people having issues trying to load these digital books um, into e-readers. Or you couldn't get it on a Kindle, I think, because it was a weird PDF file. It's all very strange. Um, that eventually did lead to them changing how they did it because um, the CEO kind of asked, kind of seemed a bit shocked at that, but he kind of took notice of it and they did change how they do it. They they still watermarked it, but it became a lot easier. And I don't know how it's whether it's any different now. I don't know whether they put up generic, you know, EPUB files like they should, but it just struck me as very strange that they they did want to compete with Amazon, but they were making it really hard for people to download directly and buy directly. And that seems like the, the main power of being a publisher and a fairly big one is that you should be trying to do more of that, I thought, the yes. same way that indies are trying to figure that out as, as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so at that point, you'd already be, you'd started writing. Um, and um, do you mind me asking how old you are and when you first started writing? Is this something you grew up with? or? Uh, so... I'd always wanted to write. It was like the dream at the back of my head, you know, as a kid growing up, but you don't do a lot of creative writing in schools. No one really teaches it. There's not a lot of encouragement. So it was always just the back of the head pipe dream that I never took too seriously. Um, when I started writing the first, so I had like chapters and very, you know, hundreds of different starts to a book over the years, but never really got much further than chapter five, you know. Uh, when I started taking it seriously was I'd come down to London to do a, GDL course, which is a very condensed law degree. For those that don't know, it's kind of rather than doing a law degree in the three years, it would be one year. So it's very intense, very brutal. Can you imagine? Um, yeah. And about halfway through that, I had a what I can only call a quarter life crisis and uh, didn't want to continue on that route. I finished the course, but I started writing what became my first book at the same time um, in a kind of mad, you know, staying up to midnight every night doing all the coursework and then turn it right on top of it, which I couldn't handle though. That'd be, that'd be far too much. But so I was 22 when I wrote the first book and I would have been 23 by the time it got published. Uh, and that first series wrapped up when I was 25. So quite young, mm -hmm. quite young. Well, that's great. Um, and in those early days, how much did you know about self-publishing and what did you do? Uh, I was I was very much learn, learn as I go, sort of learn by doing. Um, the reason I chose self-publishing was in in that moment of kind of crisis uh, and writing that first book was an escape valve, but I, in order to kind of chase the, the idea of being an author, I had to know the book could come out because I think the idea that I would write the book and then gamble with the idea of it going through agents and publishers, it would have taken a lot of time. I don't think it would have given me the same drive. So knowing that I could make it happen was really important. Like I, I could just keep pushing, pushing through all the, everything that was going topsy-turvy and a bit wrong. I could just keep pushing towards that goal, you know, really single-minded. And it was, I, yeah, that kind of saved me a little bit. I think that was, uh, that was necessary. So that's why, that's why I chose to self-publish in the first place. And so that was late 2015, that first book came out. Um, and I can't remember when I started finding, you know, your guys' show and other, uh, other authors like this, but it's over the years, it's kind of, the information has by osmosis kind of sunk in. There were a lot less resources to my mind in 2015. Like I feel like even this podcast started in 2016, I want to say, or maybe a bit later. Uh, yeah, probably um, probably right. Yeah, 2016. Yeah. yeah. So I, I can't really remember where I found out a lot of that information initially, but probably just hodgepodge of sources. And of course, the first time I did stuff, it wasn't very, wasn't very good. You kind of, I learned a lot by doing. A lot of mistakes were made and a lot of lessons were learned. Um, so just kind of figuring it out as I go along. Back yeah, then. it's interesting the point you make about um, about wanting to know that there was a, a an outlet for your writings. That's I'd never occurred to me before. That's must be very dispiriting being a trad published or wannabe trad published author. We know how hard it is to write a book, writing a book never knowing if it's going to be published or not. Whereas self publishing authors, there's a one hundred percent guarantee that that is not going to go to waste. Yeah, definitely. I mean it. it Everyone's got a different personality and outlook on it. You know, I do think 
for some people, trad is the best route for them because they wouldn't feel comfortable handling all the stuff that you have to do self-publishing. They wouldn't, you know, that's just not who they are. And that's great. They can, they can go that route, but there is that risk that, yeah, you, you will occasionally come across people who say, I have written X number of things and none of them have been picked up yet. And, but they still don't want to self-publish, um, which is fine. I guess that that's entirely up to them, but that for me just wouldn't have worked. I think I would have, I, yeah, it's, I, I'm the type of person that quite likes having the control, having had it for so long now, I, I feel much more um, calm having that control, naturally giving that away would have, would terrify me at this point, I think yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. So it's, yeah, for me, it was that, that knowledge that it would happen. And so even if I made mistakes and I made plenty, and even if I did stuff wrong, I could fix it. I could change it. I could learn. Um, and that, that has suited me. And I think if you are, if that sounds like you, then self-publishing probably does suit you as opposed to going the, the, tra the traditional route. Yeah. Tell us about the books, Michael. So uh, epic fantasy. Are they big? Yeah. Oh, they're pretty big, yeah. The, the last book, I put out a book in July, which is 250,000 words long. So okay. pretty big, <laughs> pretty big, chunky um, epic fantasy books. Um, yeah, so my current series, uh, as I say, a big dragon, dragon rider epic, um, kind of trying to be the spiritual successor to um, Aragon by Christopher Parolini and his series um, Inheritance. I felt like, I think that series wrapped up in 2010 or 2011. And by the time I got to 2018, thinking about this uh, series, I just sort of felt like there hadn't been a follow-up, like there hadn't been another one of those in some time. Um, and I just wanted to throw my hat in the ring. It's, it's a great, it's, a, it's the kind of perfect distillation of like all the tropes, but yet the, it's boundless, so you can do so much with it. Um, and then wanted to go down that, down that road. So what makes this series different? Uh, for starts, the dragon in it is blind. So there's a little bit of inspiration from how to train your dragon, where the kid and the dragon really need each other because the dragon in that and then how to train your dragon can't fly without the boy hiccup. He has to engineer a tail fin onto the dragon if, if, if no one's familiar with those films. Uh, and the same in this series, because the dragon is blind, he really relies on the human boy for especially for flight, because they kind of sense share and he sees through the boy's eyes, but he also um, wants for from really young. He was not meant to hatch. The dragons in this world are very um, against any weakness. So that, that egg was just to be destroyed, sort of chucked into the sea. And when the the main character, Holt, finds out about this, he's just, he's just stunned. He can't believe it. He thought the dragons were so amazing. So he saves the egg against everyone's, you know, against everyone's wishes. And he will get into a lot of trouble, but he saves it anyway. And so when it hatches, it's this blind baby dragon that bonds to him. So that their relationship is really, really strong. And they wanted to focus on that, that kind of that that bond being so powerful and based on compassion, not based on a kind of prophecy or a bloodline or rebelling against an empire, just something very pure. Um, and I think people have really latched onto that. It's a slight twist on it's just it's a lot of the same. Uh, tropes but twisted and freshened up in that interesting way and i think people have really responded to it yeah and, you, and this is epic fantasy but you say the portal yeah. um business was around lit rpg was it? yes uh yeah it was lit rpg we started off in the kind of classic if you can call it the classic lit rpg space of you know the, the virtual reality games that people would go into and then the story takes place in there Lit rpg moves very rapidly and even within a few years it had kind of moved away from being virtual reality to just um, more like you fall through a portal into a world that happens to run by game mechanics you get sucked into another dimension you whatever there's some kind of apocalyptic event that for some reason turns the world into a game uh, people wanted to get out of the vr thing and just make basically huge big fantasy worlds that run on very strict game-like mechanics and nowadays it's even just moved even softer towards what might be what we might call progression fantasy where again it's like big secondary worlds but there's very 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 hard magic systems where there's a clear rank rank structure to how powerful you are with the magic and the the nature of a lot of the books are your character starts as you know uh, a level one you know noob let's say they're they're a nobody but the promise is they're going to become whatever the god tier in this world happens to be and you're sort of seeing them go through all the stages of that 
the best example of that out there is the Cradle series by Will White. Um, 12 books long, it just finished this year. Um, hugely successful, wildly successful, and probably the best example of that genre out there. Yeah, you talk about the um, yeah. the kind of rules uh, of this. Is that the same in epic fantasy in that you have you have to create a fairly hard universe. You can't, we've had this conversation on the podcast before, like the prequels in styles where suddenly the force, right. you know, it kind of lost its magic because it, they were so mm. loose with the rules is epic fantasy. Do you have to be fairly strict about that? No, you can, you can do what you want. You just, as long as you're consistent. So some people right. will write epic fantasy stories more akin to Tolkien's magic, which is quite soft. There are some hard rules in it, but it'll be quite soft, quite, mystical, ethereal, you don't really understand it, the characters may not even understand it. As long as you're consistent, that will be fine. You don't want to then throw in a, a suddenly a very hard system in the middle of that. You know, I think it's about being tonally um, uh, similar throughout. And, but you people will set up very hard uh, world rules. Uh, Brandon Sanderson is the famous, you know, the most famous for this, where his magic systems are very hard in the sense that you, the reader, will understand the magic um the characters will understand it there may be mysteries to it which will be uncovered throughout the books but you will always have a a good grasp of it but i think that is the best way to describe the difference between hard and soft um rules for magic it's kind of more how much does the reader understand versus you know the author might have a set of rules but he you keep it hidden to create that sense of it being ethereal and mystical but if the reader could repeat back the rules to you and understand it then You've made it quite hard. And there's two perfectly awesome styles. And um, it does split some people at the margins, but I think most people enjoy a bit of both. You know, it's different flavors. Um, for my first series, the magic was quite soft, but in the Dragon Rider series, it's quite hard. The magic between the, the rider and the dragon is very hard in the sense that the riders have very set abilities. So they can't just do whatever they want. Uh, they develop um, a handful of abilities each that they hone. Uh, and there's blacksmithing magic, there's cooking magic. Each of these has their own rule sets. And so the reader knows what can be done. But every so often I leave the door open so that you can bend the rule or, you know, do something in a unique way that you might not initially think of. And so that keeps it kind of fresh and interesting. Um, Mark, a bit like playing a game and finding a glitch or a bug in the game that you exploit. Like, um, oh, okay. I think there's a lot of fun that comes out of that. Yeah, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you're British by your accent, and uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, is your market mainly Britain, or is the US a big part of it? No, the no, the US is by far the the big majority. I think, you know, and it's starting to the UK, Australia is starting to contribute more than it did, but for a long time, I would say ninety percent of the sales and income was coming from the US. Um, it's starting to the only and the US hasn't really changed the change that it's just the UK and Australia are starting to come up a little bit so that percentage is shifting but it's it's the vast vast majority is from the US. Do you write your books with uh, American spelling or any nods towards American English? Yeah I do I do for songs because for the first series in Dragon's Blade I did that in UK English because I didn't even consider this as a factor right I just wrote it and then obviously I have a UK copy editor and stuff so we just kind of wrote it and, and did it that way and of course Amazon only lets you upload one version and the number of comments i got on that first series people saying that there was so many spelling mistakes this person has no copy editing mm -hmm. and after, I, after a while i was like oh it's just there is because the mistakes they were highlighting weren't mistakes it was just uk english yeah um so frustrating as that is uh, i decided for everything after that series i would write in us english and my copy editor would do it in us english you still get some people who, you know, I, when you start doing that, you realize how different everything is. Like almost everything is spelled a little different. Um, and also turns of phrase, there'll be a turn of phrase that we will use here that the Americans don't have at all. And so what seems really natural to put in, they'll flag as like, what does this mean? Um, yeah. For example, like the phrase, um, I guess it's a British phrase. I don't think it's Scottish particularly, but if you were to say someone is making a meal of something, you get that sense that, they're over egging it, they're being a bit over dramatical about, you know, they're taking too long, they're dragging it out. They they don't know what that means. So I put that in. <laughs> so someone came to me back and said, Is he eating that? 
what do you mean he's making yeah. a meal of it? You know, is he eating? No, no, no. So there's lots of stuff like that which you run into. Um, wouldn't it be great if Amazon allowed us a the UK version, version yeah. a US version, also so that you can put a different cover on them as well? Because yeah. Because I but, think, yeah, that would be fantastic. Which is one thing the Trad World has been doing for years is, is versioning yeah. their, their books. And, but, um, yeah. And it would definitely be helpful, I think, yeah. because relatively speaking, my first series, which was UK English with, I guess, more UK graphic kind of covers, sold a little better relatively than this current series. So my current series is US English, you know, uh, custom illustrations on the cover. You see the character on the cover. Sells really well in the States. It does sell well here. Um, when people see it, like physically on, uh, in real life, um, they love it. But something about that online doesn't seem to appeal as much. So yeah, it'd be great if you could have separate covers, separate editions, maybe one day. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah. So what are you yeah. doing in terms of marketing? Is it mainly Facebook ads or Amazon ads? Or do you do a bit of social media, TikTok? <clears throat> uh, I never found Facebook ads hugely effective uh, for eBooks. I think most Epic Fantasy offers struggle in this regard. I think, you know, it seems like romance, thriller, crime, works quite well with Facebook still. But for us in Epic, it just seems like either Facebook doesn't know who to target or or the targeting is very limited. Um, it did work for audio. Initially, um, I found audio success, Facebook advertising, my box set. So I have a 46 hour box set of the first trilogy, which I started advertising during COVID actually. And for whatever reason, that, that took off very well then. Um, of course, it was hard to scale it, so there was a sweet spot with the spend. Uh, and then then the US election happened, and the iOS privacy change happened. And after that, it just seemed to falter. It didn't seem to work as well. But I was fortunate in that I kind of pushed the boulder up a hill, so I kind of pushed it into the algorithm. And even though uh, I, I'm not spending any money in Facebook advertising the audio at all now, the audio books keep selling very, very consistently and very high. So. That worked out quite well. Um, I would encourage, I mean, so from my experience, um, audio ads for Facebook did work for me. Um, I don't think they work as well now because of those changes, but you should give it a try and see because the audio store is like, what, a third the size of the ebook store in terms of how many sales will equal a ranking. You know, even a small amount of spend, like 10 pounds a day or something, um, you'll see results because if you get some sales in audio, your rank will jump up quite a bit. You'll see a really noticeable difference. Whereas if you've got a handful of ebook sales, you might not see that difference in the ranks quite so much. Yeah. So it should be really obvious if it's working. You'll know really quickly and you can keep it going or turn it off. Um, so at, at the moment, I don't spend anything on Facebook. I do run Amazon ads. Um, they kind of seem like life support in a way, like there's a sweet spot again, like it's really hard to scale them, right? If you tell Amazon to double the budget and double the bids, it sometimes just shrugs and goes, nah, yeah. no, I'm not going to do that. So you kind of, I found the sweet spot where I can keep it running at a budget I'm happy with, at a bid I'm happy with, and that just sort of ticks it along, getting that visibility um, just in the background. And then after that, it's been uh, more recently in the last year and a half or so, I've been making a big effort to reach out to a lot more uh, book reviewers and booktubers in the epic fantasy space. Um, I've become aware of how many people are still relying on finding their books from going into bookshops. You know, there's a lot of people that still go into shops to look for stuff. And so they're never going to find indie stuff um, and they're primarily print readers. Um, and so reaching out to some of those influencers seem to talk to those people like that kind of space, which we might call in quotes, trad readers, but only because their preference is print, their preference is bookstores. And there's a huge, that's a huge part of the market in it. And it actually seems like they're the most vocal online. They're the, they're the people that really champion stuff and, and spread the word about stuff. Whereas lots of people that are reading the eBooks and audiobooks, um, they're there, they turn up, they buy, but they may be on online shouting about it from the rooftops. So it's, I've been finding it, um, it's a slow process, but beginning to kind of crack into that space has led to a huge jump in print sales, which is great because that's like opening up a whole new format uh, and getting more attention online, which obviously has a nice trickle effect for everything. So that's been my sort of switch now to try and do that lot more longer term influencer kind of outreach. Um, 
which is a much slower game. Like you, you can send books out to folks, and it might take them a year to get to it. Right. You know? um, yeah. yeah, it's and, not going to be immediate. And are you uh, using Amazon POD for that delivery, or are you using Bookvault or some direct no. sales? Or... Um, I I switched every I switched all my print into Ingram Spark this year. Uh, I always had the KDP print and the Ingram Spark print. And I discovered. I don't think they make it very public knowledge, but if you sell enough copies through Ingram Spark in a uh, in a period, you will access a slightly better account, and then you'll get a print discount on um, retailers. So, and you'll also start to get bulk discount if you print lots of copies. So there was two reasons to move into this. One was, um, I don't know if you've heard of them in the UK. There's a special edition fantasy shop called The Broken Binding. So they do lots of signed copies, lots of special edition and box editions. Um, I started working with them to to handle all my signed books because before that, I didn't really have a way to viably do it. I didn't want to spend time going to the post office all the time. Now, I, they take a bunch of copies of me. I hand sign them. They sell them and handle everything else. So that's great. So printing those off the back end, um, you know, through Ingram can be expensive. But with the pro account, when you unlock it, the more copies you print, the deeper your print discount becomes. And so over time, that can be very powerful. Um, it, it can help to open up the idea of maybe I'll go hand sell at some big events. You know, MCM Comic Con is in London, that's close by. If I sold a couple of hundred books, like each one of those for uh, you know twice a year, I'm gonna build up a really deep discount on the paperbacks, stuff like that. Um, and you also get to, when you unlock the pro account, you also get a, a 10% discount off of a, a like a retail sale. So if someone orders a copy through Amazon, you're getting a cheaper print there, which means a little bit more in your pocket as well at the end mm. of the day. Or or you can push their uh, discounts a little bit higher to try and crack into some of the stores. So in the UK, it's almost impossible to get into Warstones as an indie because they really want to order through Gardeners. So unless you're doing small print runs yourself and putting it into Gardeners, if you're using a PLD service, there's too many people in the middle. The discount just becomes too low. But in America, uh, they're more they, they like to order from like places like Ingram directly, so they don't go through as many middlemen. So the discount actually helps you there. And so I've been slowly building a presence in Barnes and Nobles. Um, I think I've got nine or ten stores that are stocking wow. the books, which is a small foothold. But yeah, you know, everything starts with a small foothold, and off off we go. So. Yeah, so that was everything went to Ingram for that reason. Um, and I, and then obviously as you ship books to all these influencers, booktubers, other reviewers, uh, giveaway winners, everything, all of that adds up to increase the discount that you start to get because you're putting out more and more and more orders. Um, so it's a bit, you do need the budget, obviously. If, you're, if you start printing all these books, you've got to have the budget to handle it. But I'm in a fortunate position where I do. So that's kind of been the shift away from heavy spend on digital ads like Facebook and into that kind of softer um, touch approach. But comes with its own costs. Yeah. How do you get the pro account then? You just sell enough copies. Oh, so in you get invited in. A, a year. Yeah, you get invited in. Um, it's not It's not an astronomical amount, um, maybe a couple of thousand. But, you know, it, it is that kind of that kind of tells you how hard it is for indies to get a couple of thousand sales in print in the space of, say, 12 months. Yeah. Like, it's not... It's not that common. And usually for, if you can, for people, Ingram Spark is a, an also thing. Most of their print sales are going to be POD. So I suppose you'd need to close yes. that off, transfer completely, redo your list, your Amazon listing to include the Ingram, et cetera, to try and get that 2000. Yeah. Well, the, I always, uh, I, I own the ISBNs. So, so even when they were on KDP, I used my own ISBNs. So switching it was relatively easy in the sense that it was set up on both platforms. All I had to do was turn the KDP ones off. Yeah. And then everything just migrated naturally over. Um, so yeah, if you were, if, if you're out there, if you're interested in getting that account, just, I would think about switching everything into Ingram. Um, the KDP margins used to be quite, bit, uh, quite a bit better, but it doesn't look like that's the case anymore. If you are able to unlock the pro account, you probably get more via Ingram Spark for your print sales. Mm -hmm. So might be something to think about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And Michael, you're you're doing all of this 
doing all of this. All of this. You're doing all of this and you've done all of this, <laughs> yeah. but at the same time you were, uh, you have cystic fibrosis, something you mentioned in your, yeah. your bio to me, um, which I know a little bit about. I think it's a genetic condition you're born with. Yeah, yeah, it's a genetic condition. Uh, you just have it from birth. Uh, it primarily affects the lungs. Um, it's a sliding scale for everyone. So some people have it really severe. Some people have it very, very light. But um, it affects how the enzymes in your body are produced. And so I have to take you know dietary supplements for to, to eat food and stuff like that. That one's okay. The, the thing that affects people worst of all is in the lungs, uh, the enzyme that your body would make naturally to get rid of all the gunk and mucus doesn't work for us. So your lungs have a, a habit of getting filled up with that kind of gunk and they can be inflamed and get infections and stuff like this. Um, so that it can be very hard and people can, you know, need lung transplants and stuff like that. I'm, I'm fortunate that I never was that severe, Right. but it was, you know, but it was bad enough, you know, every so often in 2019, I had two infections that were bad enough that I was in hospital for a total of like two months over the year. Like it's, it can be rough. It yeah. can be very rough. And massively yeah. inconvenient when you're running your own publishing empire. Yes, massively inconvenient. But um, thankfully, writing, you know, doesn't demand too much on the body. So yeah. that's okay. But I, because, of, because I've had that, I've always been very conscious of being fit and maintaining fitness, you know, hitting the gym, doing that sort of stuff. Um, not Never smoking, obviously, yeah. all, that, all that sort of stuff. It was lucky. And during COVID, they brought out a new treatment. Um called Caftrio, which is a genetic therapy that actually fixes how the enzyme is produced. And after that, things got a lot better. Oh, like, wow. Kind of to the point of them saying, yeah, do you know what? At this rate, everything, you're basically normal now. Just as long as you keep taking the tablet and it, and it keeps working, there's no reason why you shouldn't live until you're 88, you know? Oh, that's fantastic. Um, yeah. So they did. It's kind of like a soft cure, but it, it does depend on how, you know, if you were very severely affected, it will help you a lot, but it won't quite bring you up to scratch necessarily. But it has been very life-changing for a lot of people with CF, that treatment. Gosh. So thankfully, thankfully the last few years have been a lot better. Oh, that's really good news. I wish you well in that. And I know I can remember covering this story when I was a, a BBC reporter and getting to know a couple of people and uh, a friend of mine was a lung surgeon as well. So, and that's why I know a little bit about it. But I seem to I recall... Not that long ago, maybe twenty years ago, the average age of somebody with CF was in the thirties. So that's that sounds like yeah, that's a that's massive think, step forward. It wasn't. I, I don't think. It, I think if you googled it, even a few years back, Google would have told you it was like thirty-seven was the life expectancy. Um, I think you know into the twenty tens, life expectancy would be a lot better because they were always developing better treatments. But with with the new one with Caftrio, um, which um, does seem to help the vast majority of people who suffer with CF, it really has kind of normalized things out. Um, even for me having, because I was, what, I was I was in my late 20s then, so like 29 when the treatment came out. Uh, and it's completely changed my life. And so anyone that is born now mm. can get on that treatment straight away. Hopefully they just have no problems. Hopefully they can just live a very normal life and don't have to worry about it. Gosh, that's such a breakthrough. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. What a is. good news uh, health story. Um, for a terrible condition. The very last thing, we didn't talk about audiobooks. I know that's been uh, an important area for you as well. Yeah, well, I mean, so I self-fund all the audio productions and I self-publish them through ACX, which is unusual. I, I mean, the, the majority of indie authors do seem to sell their rights to a studio, Podium, Tantor, Recorded Books, Dreamscape, or Audible itself, right? So I think um, it does... It's, it's a little bit unusual in, in that regard. Um, and the reason I want to, wanted to bring it up is because people come and talk to me about it. They want to know about it. Oh, they want to know why, uh, what's helped with my success. The, the truth is without self-publishing the audiobooks, I wouldn't be living the life that I'm leading because that is my bread and butter. That is also, it, it's the biggest chunk of my income. And increasingly, it's also the biggest chunk of the unit sales as well. So if I had, if I didn't hold all those rights, I'd be making half or a third of the income per unit you know and therefore everything would be dramatically lower um there's many good reasons to sell your rights especially if you're starting out but as soon as you do that you're kind of hybridizing a little bit right you're not purely indie now you're working with this publisher even if they're audio only uh, and if things blow up you're not making as much money per sale now that's great when you start out if you need that 
if you need someone to back you initially, I think go for it. Everyone's going to have their own situation there. But if you find success, I would encourage people to um, think carefully about when they come to write a, a next series or something fresh, whether they want to sell that again or actually keep a hold of it. Because I tell you, it's been it was completely transformative to go from relying solely on the ebooks to suddenly having ebooks and audiobooks both working. So now you have two formats working for you. You're not you're not as psychologically dependent on KEU, for example. Kindle Unlimited becomes a smaller piece of the pie. Uh, and now now with the print sales also coming up, that also just helps smooth all that out. Like you getting every format working is going to do a lot more than just relying on that one ebook income. It also it also means that any anything that I do marketing wise or any money that I do spend in advertising, it doesn't matter which format someone goes and buys, I'm still getting the most out of it, um, which I think, um, I'm, so that makes me more willing to experiment like next month. Um, we're recording this November, in December. Uh, I'm doing a relatively high cost YouTube sponsorship as an experiment. Um, and I'm kind of happy to do that because if everyone goes and buys the audiobook, that's good. If everyone goes and buys the ebook, that's fine. It doesn't really matter which way they go. Whereas a lot of um, friends that I know, if they did something like that, if they put a lot of money and effort into marketing, but by chance most people went got the audio, well, it's more the it's more the publisher that wins, and you've just put a lot of money down. Yeah. So you find yourself in that in that difficult position. Whereas if you're fully traditional, yes, it's all down to the publisher. You wouldn't think to spend money advertising, right? Because it wouldn't work. Just it wouldn't uh, work cost wise. Um, if you're just pushing your ebook, that makes sense. But when you're kind of pushing just in general, you, yourself and your books, um, knowing that you don't get the full whack off of a certain format, I think does make people think twice about pushing the boat out and experimenting as much as they might. Um, so I would just, there's always going to be good reasons to sell the rights, of course, but I would encourage people to think a bit, don't just by default hand it off, even if you've built that relationship up, because you could be, you could be doing so much more on your own. So you're you're self-funding the production, which is something I do as yeah. well, actually. Um, and are you then not going exclusive with ACX? Are you going <clears throat> wide? No, no, I'm going exclusive. Oh, you are um, exclusive, okay. Yeah, yeah I'm exclusive. Um, and it's kind of that situation now where, because they are selling so well, um, I, have a, I have a rep with Audible via ACX, so I do get access to some of the promotional opportunities that a, a publisher would. Um, not all, but some. Like he, his job is to kind of pitch my books for more, you know, uh, promotional activity, and that's it. That really helped with the launch of the third book in the series in, in the summer. Uh, so it kind of feels like I'm a little bit golden handcuffed to it. Like if I went exclu- if I went wide and tried to sell on my own website, yeah, you won't get that. It's it's a big it's a big debt. You wouldn't get the same treatment. So you know that that is. It has that has its own problems that idea but it's kind of like a bucking bronco i'm kind of staying on right now so i'll stay on for a while i'll stay on as long as i can yeah. um it's interesting also I, the problem yeah go, sorry, go on. i was gonna say because i i am flirting i've been exclusive with acx since the beginning of my two audio books and i am thinking because i don't have a big series like you of experimenting with going wide setting up the book funnel thing yeah and then direct advertising because you know, it's so and i'm a big facebook ads guy but you've got a margin you're make, making two or three dollars usually two right. two dollars yeah. and so your margin is so small but suddenly being able to make seven or eight nine ten dollars on a single sale gives you so much more mm. breathing space with the facebook ads campaign i thought I'd, would look forward to having a bit of that but um i might i might experiment with it for 90 days and see how it goes yeah i you know i think i do think selling direct is going to be or has to be the future in some regard, but we're still in the early days of that. Um, I kind of straw poll my own my audience on whether if I were to release a book like that wide and sell it from my website, how many people would come and pick it up? And there was a very depressing sense of no, because I just want everything on my Audible app. Yeah, you know, they it's just slick, it's easy. I've got people in my Discord. It's obviously a fantasy Discord uh, that they are huge. They backed the Brandon Sanderson Kickstarter you know, for those four books. Um, and despite having paid for the Kickstarter and therefore they have access to everything, they still haven't listened to those books on audio because it's not on, they're not on Audible. Even wow. though that's how they listen to all his books, with those books, they're like, no, because it's not on Audible. <laughs> and that made me think, well, if the Brandon superfans won't even move yeah. platforms, it's still a little too early 
um, for me. Um, you know, Epic Fantasy does sell disproportionately better in audiobooks because they're longer. So the credit system benefits us, right? If you've got a 25 hour audiobook, people see that as higher value for their credit, which is a fixed price. Um, and that's why in the audio charts, you see so much Epic Fantasy ranking very, very high. Whereas in the ebook and print, it's going to be a lot more romance and, and thriller and crime and stuff like that outranking us. Um, so it's kind of, I think, play to your strips. If you are writing big, long books like this, audio might be a really good place to try and grow. Um, but I would be, I'd love, to, I'd, I'd love it if you went right wide with yours and it worked because we need to sort of push that frontier a little bit. I think yeah. it's the, the only way to escape, you know, as you say, the golden handcuffs is to eventually get to that place where people are comfortable to come and buy from us. I'm experimenting right now with that by, um, I have two novellas that I'm releasing for free on my mailing list as like an incentive. And I also got them recorded. So I'm offering my audio book listeners something as well, um, rather than just the eBooks, because why would they want that if they're audio listeners? So I'm in the process of doing that with BookFunnel and setting that up and learning all of that and hopefully getting people used to it so that maybe one day in the future, uh, we can we can try that. Brilliant. Okay, well, Michael, it's been really brilliant talking to you. Um, like I said earlier, you've done a you've done a great job, and uh, you're building quite an empire there. So I'll let you know how my uh, my direct sales go with yeah. the audio book, and okay. uh, yeah. you stay in touch with us so we hear how you're going as well. Really, thanks, James. This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. <laughs>